Today we are beginning a new series uh, in our church. We just finished the series in the book of Proverbs on the seven deadly sins and so on. And today we are beginning a new series in the Gospel of John. The jo- Gospel of John is an account of Jesus' life that's written by one of Jesus' disciples named John. Uh, there's lots more to say about that, but we're going to do that as we go through the series. We're going to talk about who John is and about his style that's different than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, we're going to see some of the unique things that John does. But today as we begin, what I really would like to do is simply let John tell us where we want to start, and that is with his introduction to his gospel, verses 1 to 5. And so we're going to read that in a moment together, and then we're going to talk about what that means and what it's all about as we experience what John is saying, that no one is like Jesus. But before we do that, let's take a moment to pray. Father, I pray that as we open your word right now, that you would do a work by your spirit in every single one of our hearts, no matter who we are or where we are, and that by your spirit, you would help us to see Jesus And in seeing Jesus, we would be turned into people who are in awe of him and changed because of him. Help us to know what that means, to experience what that means, and in doing so, to be changed to love and serve you and to love and serve others. Will you do that work by your Spirit's power in Jesus' name? Amen. So I encourage you, if you uh, are able to, follow along in a Bible. If you don't have one, you can follow along. If you're watching online on the link that's below the description, uh, you can find an online Bible there. And you can also follow along by reading on the screen as the passage will be up there as well. John 1, verses 1 to 5, reads this way. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John, as he begins uh, his account of Jesus' life, as he tells the story of who Jesus is, uh, he purposely is beginning with certain key things that we need to see today And the question I think that's important for us to even ask at this moment is, well, why would we even bother? Why bother learn about who Jesus is? Why bother read the gospel of John? Why bother listen to what John has to say? I mean, isn't it possible that Jesus is just another religious leader like everybody else? Isn't he just uh, a human teacher who has some teaching that maybe you like certain parts of? But why bother listen to him over above others? Why listen to Christianity and Jesus' claims rather than, say, Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or any other world religion or for anything else for that matter? Why bother listen and learn about Jesus? And John would say, as he's beginning here in his gospel account, the things he's saying about Jesus is really saying in one sense that this listening to Jesus is the most important thing you could do. It's actually a matter of life and death. In this passage, even in this short piece, he's saying that Jesus is the only true source of life. And we'll see lots more about that in a moment. And he's saying in order to know what real life is about, what, in order to know and experience real life, you need to meet and know Jesus. No one else is like him. Not even close. The claims that John is going to make about Jesus, even in these first five verses, are so big that they cannot be ignored because if they're true then they are the most important claims you could ever think about. And what I'd like to do is work through them with you. And John himself, as he begins to explain this, later on to make sure we don't miss it, at the end of his account pretty much in John chapter 20, he tells us that he's written everything he's about to, that he's writing right now, that he's written everything, verse 31 of chapter 20, it says, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that's the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. You see, what John is saying is that you want to find life, you want to find real life, you need to meet and know Jesus. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at verses 1 to 5 and look at the three claims that John makes about Jesus. That Jesus is the word, number one. Two, that Jesus is the creator, number two. And three, that Jesus is the light. Okay, so Jesus is the word, Jesus is the creator, and Jesus is the light. And what I want to do is I want to show you what each of those claims is about, and then also why that makes a difference and why it matters for your life. Let's begin. Jesus is the word. Now, it's very interesting that John begins in verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And it begs the question for anybody who's reading this or listening to it for their very first time, 
Who is this, the word? What's, what's this all about? And as anybody should, when you're going to interpret a document, you should look at the document itself and what's closest to it to get an answer. And the answer begins by John later on in verse 14 and following, telling us that the word became flesh and the word is no one else except for Jesus. That Jesus is the word. And the question that I think you have to ask then is, well, why doesn't he just say that? Why doesn't, why doesn't John just say, in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. Why not just talk about him and say Jesus? Why use the word? And there's piles of stuff written about this. And one of the things that's important to, to realize as you wade through it all, there's really two main things that often people say is the reason they think John did it this way. Uh, the one reason is that uh, people argue that John was actually using this, the word, because in Greek, it's actually the word logos. That's the Greek word that's used here over and over again. And John's doing that, it's argued, because in that day and age, in Greek and in the time frame that he was living in, Greek philosophy included the idea that this word logos was a special word that stood for a number of different meanings. Here's a few of them. The logos was considered the rationale for all of life. That your logos was the thing you look to to understand what life is all about. The logos was also the source of rational thought. And also the logos was looked to as the intermediary between God and people, between the gods and the people. The idea was that this logos was in a sense at the center of all humanity and all of life itself. That if you wanted to understand rational thought, if you wanted to understand your meaning, your identity, and your purpose in life, if you want to understand anything about life, you needed to know and understand the logos. The other big main purpose that uh, people think John did this and the other argument that happens, the people who, who make a claim about it, is they say that John used the word not because he was trying to appeal to Greek-speaking philosophers of the day, but actually because John's referring back to the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. That John is actually making references here and he's helping people see that this word that he's describing here and he's going to describe him and then name him as Jesus, this word is God and he's God because he's the same God as the God of the Old Testament. That the word is often used in the Old Testament to stand for God, that the word of God is God. And so what John's doing right away is he's saying, you know, the Old Testament describes God as an eternal, powerful, speaking God. That's Jesus. That Jesus is the God of the Old Testament that you've heard so much about. Jesus is God. And the way he writes it by describing it as in the beginning, which is an echo of Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the world, and then says, and God said, what John is doing here is he's basically saying, Jesus is that God. And I would actually say that as I've done the study and worked at it, and you can look at this yourselves, and you can figure that out and think about it more yourself, I think the second argument is actually much stronger than the first. And while it might be a happy, in a sense, coincidence or God using any possible means to help people understand the gospel, the true sense of John's use of the word, the word, is most likely to point us to the fact that Jesus is the eternal, powerful, speaking God. That Jesus, as we'll see more later on, is the, the creator who spoke it all into being. But here John's saying, please don't miss this. I'm telling you right off the bat, in the beginning was the word. Jesus was there in the beginning. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. And verse 1 again, that Jesus is God. The word was God and is God. In other words, Jesus has always existed. He's not simply some merely human invention or person who showed up on the scene. Jesus is a real person, a human person who showed up, but it's because he's God who took on flesh. He is God himself, the God who has been there from the beginning, that he has no beginning like this universe does, but he is actually God himself. None other than the eternal, powerful, speaking God. That's what John's claiming here, right off the bat. Now, the question I think that's important to ask is, well, why does that matter? So what? Yes, that's a huge claim that Jesus is God himself from the beginning, there, God eternal, the speaking God. But what does that matter? And if you're skeptical if you're kind of wondering what Christianity is about, if you're thinking, how could I believe this kind of stuff? I think it's important for you to wrestle with this because I think even though you might say, I can't, I can't really, I'm not sure I could wrap my head around this, 
that, that I could actually accept some of Jesus' teaching. But the idea that Jesus is God, the eternal God who was there from the very beginning and he's always been there and he's powerful and he's a speaking eternal God. I'm not sure I can wrap my head around that. I'm okay with his teachings, but I'm not sure I can deal with Jesus as God. Then John's right away here in verse one and two trying to say to you, that is not an option that you have. You cannot simply say that you're gonna believe in Jesus as some great moral teacher or some human guru or somebody who's gonna teach you some things that you like part of and maybe other parts you don't. He's saying that you can't ignore Jesus that way. He's God. And you can't pick and choose what you want because when you do, you don't actually have the real Jesus. And I would say this is important for you to wrestle with for this reason, and that is this. You may at some point already, or hopefully you will in the future, experience the gift, and I'm calling it a gift, experience the gift of realizing that this world has problems that are so big and you yourself have problems that are so big that you or even the collective world itself cannot have the ability to solve them. That you actually will want Jesus to be this eternal, powerful speaking God, because only Jesus as God has the power and the ability then to solve God-sized problems. You see, the problem that we have right now is that we think that somehow we can solve them, that we can be enough, that we can do enough. But John's telling us right off the bat, we're not, not individually and not even collectively. That the world does One thing, it seems, when people get together, and that is we tend to fight and divide. And there's no hope if you're going to look to people to solve the problems of this world. And the gift is that you get to see that, that your eyes will be open to see that this world has too big a problem to actually deal with on our own. We need Jesus to be this eternal, powerful, speaking God. Now, if you're here today, uh, you're listening in, and you're tuning in, and you're wondering... You know, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian or I'm a religious person. I do believe that Jesus is God. Why do I need this reminder today? This is nice for maybe people who don't, but why would I need this reminder today? And I think John would want to say to us here today that we need this reminder if we are in that place. Uh, for example, for me too, that we need this place because in one sense, John would ask this question. It's nice to say that we believe Jesus is God, but do we really believe it? Do we really believe Jesus is God? Do our daily lives actually show evidence of believing that Jesus is God, this eternal, powerful speaking God? Do we really have in our lives the evidence? Would our neighbors, our coworkers, would our teammates, our classmates, the people who are around us in life, would they know not just that we're, you know, religious people or that we go to church on a Sunday or we tune into a church service on a Sunday, but would they actually know that we believe that Jesus is God? Not that we're religious or that we believe in God, but that we believe that Jesus is the eternal, powerful speaking God. Would there be evidence that that is true from people around us? And then would there be any internal evidence or how much internal evidence would there be if we really believe that Jesus is the eternal, powerful speaking God? Do our daily lives show it in our own personal, private lives? Does it show up in how we relate to each other, how we love each other? Does it show up in how we spend time listening to him, reading his word, praying to him, spending time worshiping him, enjoying him, delighting in him? Or is Jesus just more of a once in a while thing or a Sunday morning thing? And John would say that if we really believe that Jesus is God himself, the word, the powerful, speaking, eternal God, then the evidence would be that we actually live like it. Now, John says there's more to Jesus than just the fact that he is the eternal, powerful speaking God. In verse three, he says that Jesus is the creator, point number two. Verse three says this, he says, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And here, John, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, John is really in one sense saying that if you wanna understand who created this world, you need to look to nobody else except Jesus. That Jesus spoke this world into existence. Genesis 1, it says the same thing. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it goes on and says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. And every time it says, and God said, something new was created. 
And John here, in a sense, is echoing that concept, that reality. He's telling us that through Jesus, everything was made that was made. From the largest, most beautiful, starry night stars to the microscopic particles and even the ones we haven't even discovered yet, every single thing, from the largest to the smallest, and everything in between, plants, animals, everything, was made because Jesus spoke it into existence out of nothing. That's what John is talking about here. That's the claim he's making, that Jesus is the one who, through whom everything was made. And to just make sure we don't miss it, he says it in the negative. He says, and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, if you can think of something that was made, Jesus made it. There's nothing outside of what he has done. All things, all things, he spoke into existence out of nothing. There was a time when there was nothing, and then there was a beginning in the beginning, and then God speaks, and out of nothing, this entire universe comes into existence. That is the claim. That is the biblical claim. That is the claim that John's making, and John is simply echoing the claims of the Bible over and over again. Other authors do it too, but here John is reminding us that Jesus is this one who made all things and spoke them into existence. Now, this is another massive claim. This is a claim that if uh, you're listening right now and you're wondering how people could believe this, that you're probably somebody who's saying, how could you believe that somebody would believe that there's a God who could speak things out of nothing into existence? And I would simply want to say a few things about that. One, uh, what's amazing to me is that um, as science continues to try to uncover origins and everything else, uh, one of the discoveries that happened only in this past hundred years or so is that scientists came to agree that there was a beginning. That wasn't the case before. Before, they all believed in a universal or eternal universe, sorry, that the universe always existed. And it wasn't until they began to realize there was evidence for a beginning that they said, we can't really talk about this. We don't really want this evidence to come out and talk about this because that sounds a whole lot like Genesis 1. It sounds a whole lot like John 1. We can't, we can't admit those things. We don't want to talk about those things because it's showing there's actually a beginning. And that's the reality the Bible's been saying all along, that God's saying there was a beginning and I spoke it into existence. And while people, you might be one of them, struggle to believe that God could create everything out of nothing, what's fascinating about this is that it actually, by, by sort of admitting that's true, that you struggle with that, what we're really doing is we're uncovering a real massive problem in humanity. The problem is this, at its heart, by nature, if we might put it that way, human beings, you and me, left to ourselves, we are creatures who are constantly trying to take the place of the creator. We are creatures who act as if we are the creator. And that means that if we can't understand something, or if we can't figure out how something works, then it can't be true or it can't be possible because if it was understandable and if it was possible in our minds, then it's possible. But if it's not, then it's not possible. In other words, we make ourselves on par with the creator. If we're creatures, which is what John is telling us, when Jesus is the creator, that means we're creatures. If that's true, and the Bible's claiming it is, and I believe it's true, then that means there should be things you're not gonna understand. There should be things that you'll never understand. There should be things that remind you that you're a creature, you're not the creator. And I think the question that, 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 that we struggle with then is, why? Why should that be so important? And the answer in one sense that John's going to give us throughout the entire gospel, and I'll just briefly give it to you now, is this, is that it's not until you understand where you come from that you can understand who you are. In other words, the only chance you have to understand your true identity and purpose in life is to understand where you come from, how you're made, who made you. This is why over and over throughout Christian uh, thought, the true experience of identity and purpose only comes when you admit you're a creature and you come to know the creator. You can only know yourself when you know the creator. You can only know yourself when you know God who made you. You can only know yourself when you know Jesus, the creator who made you. Because you can only know yourself when you know where you come from. And in knowing where you come from, then you can know what your purpose is. You see, you can't understand what something is and what it's about until you understand what it's for. Let me give you an example. 
if you find a watch, you don't know what it is, and you decide to use that watch to hammer in a nail, you're going to discover quickly that it doesn't do the job, and you may be tempted to say, what a lousy thing. I'm just going to throw this away. It does a terrible job at hammering this nail. But what you fail to see is that the purpose of the actual watch is not to hammer a nail, but is to tell you the time and many other things now that our phones have turned into watches. You see, it's not until you know what something is for that you actually can understand what something is. And the longer human beings, you and I, keep thinking that somehow we can create our own identity, that we can create our own purpose, that we can create our own sense of who we are, that we can create our own reality, as people say over and over again today, the more we continue to go down that path, the more confused we'll be, the more angry and frustrated we'll be, because we're trying to take a place as creator when it's not ours to take. That there's only one creator, Jesus who made us, and until we realize that our purpose is found in living for him, and understanding who he is and how he relates to us, that there really is no hope. We'll be spending most of our lives acting as if we're a hammer when we're really a watch. And so the reality is, is that we need to understand that Jesus is the creator because it's the only hope we have to actually find our true identity and our true purpose in life. And the reality that the struggle that's in our hearts is that we don't want this that if we're really gonna be honest about it, we don't want Jesus to be the center. We don't want Jesus to be the creator. We don't want him to be the one who we need to follow, trust, obey, listen to. We don't want him to be in that place because by nature, we want to be there. We wanna be the creator. We wanna be in charge. We wanna create our own identity. We wanna believe we can. And yet the longer we do that, the longer we live in frustration, the longer we live in confusion, the longer we live dissatisfied, unhappy, lacking joy, and lacking any kind of sense of peace or rest. And it leaves us with this question, but why would I want to turn to Jesus as my creator? Why would I want to admit that Jesus is God? What would cause me to want to do that? And John tells us the answer that we can trust Jesus for our identity, our purpose, for our meaning in life, because Jesus, point number three, is the light. If you have a look at verses four and five, this is John's claim, the third claim. He's saying Jesus is the light. It says, in him was life, that's in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And what John basically is saying is here is he's saying you can trust in Jesus. You can actually trust that Jesus is the one who can give you meaning, purpose, and identity in life, that he is a creator and you're the creature. You can trust him as a creature to the creator because he is the one who gives life because he's the light. He's the light in the darkness. That's what it's saying. And now what does that mean? Well, first it means this. That means until you turn to Jesus, until you actually spend time experiencing who he is and coming to know him and submitting to him, until you actually do that, you and I, we live in darkness. That we are metaphorically, spiritually, in every possible way, apart from Jesus, we are in the dark. That if you do not know Jesus, you are in the dark. That you are then, as I mentioned before, rightly confused, never satisfied, unsure, afraid. The reason we struggle in our daily lives, the reason we struggle in our daily work, the reason that we're afraid, the reason that we struggle to figure out why we have meaning, why we have significance, the reason that we're confused about things, the way we're angry about things, the reason that life is falling apart, including us as individuals, ourselves, and the world around us, the reason all that is happening is because we are in the dark. And none of us have the ability to make the light happen. But John is saying to us, the reason we can turn and trust Jesus is because we can actually see that Jesus is the light. And please, I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying right now as if this is geared to people who do not yet know Jesus at all, the irreligious people, the skeptical people, those people. Uh, it's definitely true of them, but it's also true so often of people who are religious. When we read the gospel account of, G of Jesus from John, and you can do it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as well, what you'll discover is that the people who are most blind, and this is a theme throughout all of John, the people who are most blind are the religious people. The religious leaders are some of the most blind people in the gospel of John. 
And so please, uh, whoever you are listening right now, don't make the mistake of suddenly saying to yourself, well, I, I, I've heard about Jesus. I know about Jesus. Um, you know, I, I believe some stuff about Jesus. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm fine. Uh, you may be in the dark. You may be religiously in the dark. And John is trying to say to us, every single one of us, no matter who we are here, we need Jesus to be our light. Because the second thing he wants to tell us is Jesus is the light, and that means that we can find our hope in him. That if you want to experience real life, if you want to experience true joy, if you want to experience what it really means to be alive, what it really means to be human, what it really means to be someone who's flourishing in life, if you want to really experience life and life to the full, as John talks about it later on in quoting Jesus, then you need to meet Jesus, the light. You need to come and turn to Jesus, the light. Jesus needs to be not just somebody who you know about, but he's the light that you turn to and look to. He's the light in the midst of the darkness. He's the only one to follow, to trust, to believe, and to be on, in a sense, a daily pattern of saying, I will follow and trust you and you alone. And the reason that we can trust Jesus to be this light, to find our hope and our freedom and our joy in him, the only reason we can trust him is because John tells us in verse five that the darkness has not overcome the light. And while we're gonna talk about this a bunch of different ways, I think it's important to see even in this moment right now that Jesus is the light that you can trust because darkness could not overcome him. At one point, it seemed to. Because as John writes the account of Jesus' life, we do find out later on that near the end of Jesus' earthly life here and now, Jesus was nailed to a cross. And as he was nailed to a cross, darkness descended upon the entire world. And for three hours, Jesus suffered alone and in the dark. And there's no mistake as to what's happening in that moment. Jesus is experiencing the full weight of the darkness of being separated from God the Father, being separated in a sense from the source of light, that Jesus in that moment, what he's doing is he's saying and describing and putting on display for all of us to see that he is saying, I know that you as human beings are people who are in the dark and I know the only way to save you out of the darkness is to plunge myself into the darkness, to succumb to the darkness, to submit to the darkness, and in a sense to let the darkness in one sense seem to overcome him to the point of dying on a cross in the dark so that he could come and say, I can take you who are lost in the dark and I can take you out of darkness and bring you into the light. And the reason Jesus can say that is not because he died in the dark, but because he rose in the light. You see, the darkness could not overcome Jesus because Jesus on the Sunday morning before dawn, and that's important to realize, before dawn, before the sunlight ever came up, before there was any ever hint of light, Jesus rose from the dead in brilliant light in such gloriously bright light that those who were guarding the tomb fell blind to the side. And Jesus arose from the dead in brilliant light, proving that he is the light who conquered darkness and death and every possible thing that could keep you separated from him. And that is the reason that as a powerful, eternal speaking God, Jesus the light is reaching out to those who are in darkness, to us. And saying true hope, true freedom from the dark can be found in turning to him. And he's doing it because, as John will say over and over again, Jesus does this because he loves you. He loves us. That he plunged himself in the darkness to take us out of darkness and into light because he loves us. And the question that we finalize, we, 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 we finish with today is really, have you met this Jesus yet? For real? Really? Not just in name, not in word, not just in hearing it over and over again maybe, or hearing it for the first time. Maybe you're at a point where you really realize, I don't know Jesus. And so if you're not sure about who Jesus really is, if you're not sure if you really know him, then I would encourage you to do what John says, and that is read. Pursue it. Listen to it. 
Spend time in the coming weeks listening more to the Gospel of John. Read it on your own. Pray to this God. Ask him to help you to see him. Take the time to actually get to know who Jesus is. Not just to know about him, but to get to know him. Because John is saying this is a matter of true life and true death. And for those of you who maybe are hearing this and you're kind of cold, you're kind of just aloof, you kind of... You, you, you know about Jesus, and you would even say you know Jesus maybe to some degree, but you're just kind of cold, you're distant, you're far off. Then my word for you today would simply be this. Is it possible that the reason you're cold is not because Jesus, the light of the world, has gone anywhere? It's not because Jesus, the one who created you, has failed you or gone somewhere on a holiday It's not because Jesus isn't God right now, but it's because in your heart and your life, you actually have your focus on somebody other than him far more than you ever do on him. Isn't it possible that your life is spiraling out of control and seemingly filled with confusion and fear and everything else because you continue to try to chart your own course and you're stuck in a sense in the dark and you refuse to turn to Jesus the light? that you're only giving Jesus the light lip service rather than turning your life over to him. And so I'd encourage you too to pursue time with Jesus, that you would actually give him a chance to speak to you through his word, that you would pray to him, that you would take time to get to know him because in knowing him and spending time with him, he can and does become the center of your life. And when he does, it changes everything. And so for those of you who hear this right now and you're afraid to make that step, you're afraid to take that step, you're afraid to think that somehow, somehow Jesus could do that. You're, how could he be that great a person? How could he be God in all these ways? How could it be possible that your prayer, my prayer for you would be that you would actually believe that you're a creature, not the creator, that you are a human being, not God. And that in suspending, in a sense, your desire and your continual pursuit of thinking that you can be the center of your life and you can be God, that you would actually step aside and say, Jesus, I will be the creature. I will submit to you. I will turn to you and trust as as much as our world says, that is the craziest thing you could ever do. Right now in our culture, everybody tells you, stand up and fight for what's yours and go get what's yours because no one else is going to take care of you. And Christianity, Jesus coming to you today and saying, no, submit. Submit. Bend the knee to Jesus. No one else. Nothing else. Turn to him and only him because he's the only true source of life. He's the only true source of light. He is the creator, the eternal, powerful, speaking God who out of his love came to pursue you, to take you out of darkness and into light. Your only hope is to turn to him. Let's pray. Father, it is so easy, it seems, to dismiss these claims, to minimize these claims, to act as if we even say yes to Jesus, but live as if we don't. I pray that you would work a powerful work by your spirit in my heart and in all of our hearts here, everybody who's listening, that we would see maybe even for the first time that Jesus truly is the eternal God, powerful, speaking, light of this world, the creator of all things, including us. I pray that you would help us to bend the knee, to submit and to turn in humility to him And then to find in him the joy we long for, the freedom we long for, the satisfaction we long for, the love we long for. Will you do that work by your spirit's power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this will be a bit of an interesting combination today. We do have the opportunity. You can ask questions if you're here. Uh, You can ask orally or you can text. Or if you're listening online, you can text in if you know the number. Or you can uh, give a question. You can offer a question through the live chat. And we'll just take a moment to do that and see what questions there might be this morning. I should check my phone.
Anything on the live chat back there, guys, that you see? Okay. No? Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so the question is, is that I was making the, the, the case during the, this, this talk that uh, in order to really understand who we are, we need to understand where we're coming from. In order to understand where we come from, we need to see Jesus and meet him and read his word and pray to him and listen to him. And so in doing so, we will, we will experience that. And is there any other ways of coming to see who we are and where we come from? Um, I would probably add this, and it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I, I would add this. One of the ways that God works in us is actually not just to do this individually by ourselves, but actually to do this in community. So one of the ways that, that we hear from God and that we hear about Jesus and we understand him is actually to talk to other people about it. And so for those of you who are wondering, I don't know who to talk to, I would encourage you to find somebody, reach out. Uh, for those of you who feel like, oh, I, I, I probably could just learn enough on my own, I would encourage you to fight that temptation because it's a temptation. It's not good. And actually to engage. And so, little plug, one of the ways you can do this, you can do this by phoning somebody, by talking to somebody, by meeting with somebody individually. That's great and good. But I also encourage you, be part of a connect group. Get together with other people. Learn about Jesus together. Uh, because one of the good things that God does is he actually places us in community to learn about him in community. And so while John doesn't make a big deal about that in this passage, he will in other ones. And uh, the fact that you asked the question gives me a chance to highlight that more. So thank you. And uh, I think that's an important way for us to, to know. Anybody else? It's great. Well, let's take a moment to pray and then we're gonna sing our final song. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. That we would see his power. We would see his creativity. We would see the wonder of how he has made us. And that we would see his love. And that we would be changed people because of it. And I pray that you would help us to see that. Do that work by your spirit's power, Father. We admit, and as we'll read in the Gospel of John over and over again, unless the Holy Spirit does this work, it is impossible for us to come to see and so open our blind eyes and help us to see the wonder of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.